All right. Well, it's great to be with all of you uh, today. And I saw that a few of you last night had one of those shots in one of those, uh, at least one of those shots in one of those rooms. But I uh, really am pleased to be here. I'm glad to see uh, a good crowd. This isn't my first DEF CON, but it is my first time uh, speaking. And uh, uh, Nico t uh, said that the, the top of the way it was listed wasn't, didn't have enough pizzazz, so she put from nuclear to cyber alternative approaches. So I want to make sure I get the, the nuclear part in so you don't feel like you, you, you wasted your time or wasted your ticket here, all right? So when I was in the military, my, my primary business was uh, doing nuclear ops. And, but interestingly enough, when the Air Force stood up the cyber mission, they gave that mission to my command, uh, not because they thought it was like nuclear, but because nuclear was a global mission and they saw the cyber as a global mission. But uh, what I want to talk to you about today is that we somehow are quite often constrained the way we think about cyberspace, except in places like DEF CON. And what I want to try to do is see if uh, I actually am looking to get some ideas from you, quite frankly, because the people in this room tend to think outside the box. But a lot of this is about looking at things a different way, challenging assumptions and, and looking at the way that we think about, about the world. And so the nuclear part of this is if you think about what we did with nuclear weapons at the beginning, I wasn't born then, uh, but the, those weapons were being used for war fighting. And so when we dropped them in, uh, in Japan, they were considered war fighting weapons. Very quickly they said this is not a good war fighting weapon and it became a, what they now call political weapon, or it was, it was used a completely different way. And then during the Cold War, it evolved to where the weapons became something that actually caused the then Soviet Union and the West to not fight because they were so worried that they got into a big fight that a war would break out. So what's interesting is the weapons took on a completely different context than they were originally created to do. I think there's some parallels to that in cyberspace and that's what I want to try to talk to you about uh, a little bit today. And uh, so first I want to talk a little bit about some different perspectives on cyberspace, uh, different ways to look at it, I guess I should say. I want to remind you how we tend to look at it typically from a network protection standpoint and then I want to try to argue for a, a possibly a different model to look at it that would be a proactive uh, uh, view that looks at both defense and then assurance, the ability to use it. Uh, there's another model that uh, DHS has, has put out that uh, they call their cyber ecosystem and I just want to show you that if you haven't seen it before. Uh, actually looking for some feedback from it and then tell you about some things we've done trying to put that to work. And then I want to talk a little bit about cyber workforce development. I want to extend that to, to cyber leadership and what I mean by that is Actually one of the big problems we, we would have in the Air Force is that some of our very best pilots, they loved flying so much that they never wanted to leave the airplane and uh, they got very good at it uh, but they could never get promoted and get into some jobs where they could really influence some of the things that were going on and they'd, they'd end up complaining about it but they weren't able to move up. And so part of this in terms of this leader development is I think we need to do more of that in the cyber world because for the most part the people that are making decisions about what happens uh, related to cyberspace didn't grow up from the kind of beginnings that, uh, that you're all familiar with. So, so the first thing, and this is an old slide that I used back when I was in the Air Force and part of this had to do with trying to get uh, people in the Air Force to think differently about how they approach cyberspace. But what, I, what I found was that there were, were three different ways the people in the Air Force thought about cyberspace. So the, the first one uh, was, the, was the communications groups and they said, well, cyberspace, it's all about, it's just a different way that we were able to communicate and so cyberspace is what we do because we set up all the networks, we set up the communication lines, you know, we, we manage those networks uh, when, when they break down, we take care of it. And that was a view, that, that view is actually a proper view. And then you had the, uh, the intelligence community that said, well, you know, the only way to real, really defend against attacks that we're getting in cyberspace is uh, we have to have this really good intelligence. And so, and the only way to therefore be able to defend the networks is you have to be really good intelligence people and so they argued that, that uh, cyberspace should be col controlled by the intelligence community because they're the only ones that would really fully understand uh, how uh, the intelligence and what that meant. And then, uh, but the Air Force actually took a different view uh, of this, at least initially, 
And they said, you know, uh, everybody uses cyberspace, and, and, and as it grows, we're using it more and more, and we use it for all of our different operations. And at first, the things that we did with uh, cyberspace, we used it to extend the, the, the things we're already doing. And if I, I could use a commercial example, I mean, these days nobody uses a uh, yellow pages anymore. You go on your you, know, you go on your computer and you look something up and you get a lot of information. You can Yelp it or something else and get get a review. So that's an extension. That's a, a legacy capability that you said I can use cyberspace to do that a little better. Uh, but then you have some people that, that really took cyberspace and did things really differently, like a Google or an Amazon, where they said I, I can because of cyberspace I now can do things completely differently. But but up till now, uh, for the most part. Almost everything we do is through cyberspace. Uh, very, we do very little actually in cyberspace to where, where we're at operating inside the space and there's some type of, uh, of, of uh, transactions that are occurring inside. And so people say, well, cyberspace is a really different domain because you can't, it's man-made and you can't operate, uh, you can't live there yourself. You know, you can, you can go into space, you have to have a space cap, so you can't really go into to cyberspace. So they've had some hard times getting their, their arms around this, but the, but the point of this is, is that what the Air Force did was say, we're going to put cyberspace un, in, under the control of the operators, and what we did, we said, Intel, you people keep doing what you were doing. We want you to find out where the attacks are coming and help us defend, and comm community, we want you to keep building up these uh, physical networks for us and doing all the things so that we can operate. So just some different ways to be able to, to look at this. But then when we tried to figure out how you could leverage cyberspace, uh, to tell people, you know, the, uh, the reason that we have, uh, you know, airlines is, is not so that you can have a TSA. You have a, you have a TSA to do security so that the airlines can operate safely. So it's the same thing. I mean, with, with cybersecurity, cyberspace does not exist to have cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is necessary so that you can uh, operate properly in cyberspace. But cyberspace is important because of all the things you can do with it. And so uh, one of the things that it does, it gives you this capability to bring together all these different communities. And uh, just as you see listed up here, you know, it can be whether it's a political, it can be a military, it can be economic. It, it allows you to do a lot of social things. In fact, that's one of the big areas that we see growing up uh, substantially. And of course it allows us to have, you know, the information flows all over the, the world. So. It, it allows us to, to, it's all about networking, right? So you have physical networks, you have these informational networks, and then ultimately you have people networks that are using this. And that, that whole thing put together is what makes the cyberspace so tremendous. So, but it has these interesting attributes, and one of the attributes is that, for the most part, when people are operating there, it's, uh, you're, you're anonymous when you're operating. Now you, now you don't have to be. If you want people to know who you are, you can, you can tell them, but otherwise you don't. The other thing, if you're actually inside cyberspace, if you will, you, it's, it's some kind of an alter ego that's, that's operating there. Why? Because you can't go there. So I mean, you have, you have a username or something, and it, it, it's what actually transfers through, through the cyberspace, so it's a different way to think about it. The other thing that, that's made pe uh, difficult for people to fully accept this is there's no such thing as time and distance, and it's kind of a funny anecdote that I like to tell people about this. We, we were doing an exercise, and it was a global exercise, and we had people in, in the Pacific, we had people in Europe, uh, and of course people in di several different places in the United States, and we were doing a planning operation. Of course, everybody was, was using chat rooms and they had headsets on, and uh, one of the people that came in to watch this saw these two people that were right next to each other, and they obviously were exchanging information with one another, and the, and the, the observers said, that's odd, why, why doesn't he just turn to the person next to him and, and, and tell him what he wants? And they said, and we were kind of flabbergasted, but they didn't fully appreciate the fact that there was another 200 people that were working on this project, but they're in all these different places. So this notion of time and distance is really different. That extends to this being able to, to have a virtual presence. Uh, it, it allows you to, to uh, actually work with someone, and, and if you can break through uh, the fact that you don't have the actual human contact, you can almost feel like you're doing that. But there's two other things about it that I show here. One is that with cyberspace, information has become a commodity, and as a result, we get a lot of information. In fact, we almost get more information than we can stand. And so now, we, before we used to pay to get information, now we pay people to sort our information for us, right? Because you get so much. 
And then the last one is this idea of a smart agent. And that, once again, is because you can't actually function in cyberspace, so, so you have to have an agent do it for you. And an, an idea of if we ever took the smart agent to, a, to its full potential. Uh, today, let's say you wanted to order uh, something off the internet, like a tie to, to match a suit that you had, for example. Well, you would go onto the internet, you would do some, you'd run a search engine, find some places that had it. Uh, you might look up the reviews, and then uh, you would select that tie. You'd you'd work the transaction. Uh, it would then connect you with whoever's going to work the um, the credit card, and then you get your tie, and it gets mailed to you. Well, if you had a smart agent doing this, you would actually just launch your smart agent, and the smart agent would then meet with all these other smart agents for you in cyberspace, go go make you the best deal you could find, and then the tie would just show up in, in your mail, right? That you, you wouldn't be involved with this at all. And eventually, I mean, hopefully, as a matter of fact, that's where cyberspace will go, because you'll fully leverage the network, uh, the networking capability that it brings. But again, cyberspace is very powerful, and just trying to expose just a, a, a different way to think about it. Now, this group here would understand this chart more than the typical audience that I would talk to, and they, one of the big challenges we have, um, in both in the business community and then the, in the government sectors, is that the, the way we're, we operate, in, in, particularly in the West, is it's kind of a seniority system. So you start at the bottom and then you, you work your way up. And uh, so if you look at the, at the left side there, uh, it's, it's this hierarchical structure. And the, the notion is, is that the, the higher up you are in that structure, the more power you have, the more value you have. And you're also better looking, or at least that's what everybody that's at the lower level tells you, right? Well, in cyberspace, it doesn't work that way. It's a, it's a, it's a network. It's a meritocracy. There is no top. There is no bottom. And your, your, your real power comes from how many connections you have. So, I mean, if you have a lot of information, but you have no connections, then you, you also have no power. So the more connections you have, the more powerful you are. And the other thing is it's your value. It's a meritocracy. So you, you could have a lot of connections, but if you all of a sudden kind of get lazy and you're no longer contributing anything to the network, then your value to that network goes, goes down dramatically. So, so that's very different. Well, the problem that we have is that the, the people who have, after many years, risen to some good level using that left-hand model are kind of frightened by the right-hand model. And they want to push back on it. But the reality is it, you don't have a choice. When, when you're operating in a global system, it, it's going to operate like a network. You can't force it into a hierarchy. We kind of learned that with the automobile industry, by the way. We thought that because we, can, we could control all the automobile sales that went on in, in the States, you know, they didn't need to do all the things from a quality standpoint, price control, and everything else. And then the global market came in, and uh, the, the U.S. auto industry almost failed. It was a very hierarchical approach. They adapted those same kind of methods that were being done, became a global uh, kind of a business again, and now they're starting to thrive, and they're actually doing very well. So, so understanding that you can't always force the model to operate the way you want is important. But for this group, understanding that you're fighting the model on the left, but you need to keep doing that and recognize that you're operating in this network, but there are people that want to connect with you. So this should look very familiar with you. This is the the traditional way that people look, and I say they in the Department of Defense, this is how they would look at enterprise network protection. And in the interest of time, I don't want to walk through it, but they, this came out of a, there was a, a national military strategy for cyberspace ops, came out in 2006, and then when they were looking to figure out how they were going to implement it, they, they said, well, what are the different things we need to deal with? And they realized that the, the attack vectors that are involved in doing this are Tremendous. I mean, there's all these different ways that you can get in. This community knows better than most all the different ways you can get in. One of the funny things, though, is if you want to call it funny, is that they kind of ignored uh, the social part of it, which is probably where a good 80% of the, the attacks actually come from. And when, when you look at some of the things they have, with the ways we try to do law enforcement, the, the CNDRA, that's a, a commuter network defense response capability. Where, so it's a if you, if you launch an attack, then you'd have some kind of a response. But the, uh, but the reality is when people look at this, they say, you know, that's an awful lot of different ways that somebody can get at me, so it must be impossible to protect. And realistically, 
And if this community would know, if you take this pure approach, it is going to be impossible because the advantage goes to the offense and something like this, and you can't possibly defend against every possible thing that's going to happen. So that's why I'm suggesting we, we need some alternatives to this. We need to have some different ways to think about this. And I, I asked if I could talk to this group because it, if there was anyone that would be able to find or come up with some ideas, I figured would come out of this group, you're, you're phenomenal at solving problems, right? So there's one other thing I just kind of wanted to introduce in, in terms of the, the problem set here, and that is uh, if you look on the far left side of this, you see the, um, you know, the DOD networks. Well, they're, they, they're controlled and operated a certain way. They're, they're somewhat closed. Uh, they, they've done a lot of work to reduce the gateways to the Internet, but there are still gateways. And, but there's an awful lot of information that's available from a, a protect standpoint. So they, they've got a lot of intelligence, and the intelligence comes from a lot of different means, and that intelligence is not widely shared. Now, they extend some of that to the other government networks, and they brought in the defense industrial base, that's what the, the DIB stands for, uh, because they said, you know, our adversaries are now going after the, the defense contractors who are not as well defended. So we, so based on that previous model, they're going to have to have more information to be able to protect themselves. Then as you move a little bit further to the right, now, now you get into where you're dealing with like state, still government, but you have state and local governments, and they get they get information, but they don't get as much information as they're getting on the federal side, and they don't get the same levels of protection. And of course, you have the Einstein and things like that that, are, that they've tried to put in place to do that. And they've done a lot of work with the ISACs for information sharing, and they've made a lot of progress. But, but again, less information available to you. And then you get to the far right, which is, which is everybody else. And what's interesting is that uh, the information that's now becoming available there, it, it doesn't have some of the, the sources that, the, say, the Department of Defense has, but the sources are really good. And as a result, in the commercial industry, you know, people are going to uh, uh, and being able to obtain products that really do provide a level of protection, but it's still based on this old model, I guess I would say. One other thing I wanted to show here is, which goes back to the nuclear part, is you get all the way to the bottom where, you, where it talks about the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you'll, you may or not be happy to know that none of those operate on a, on a, on a network as you would think of it. They're all, they all use circuits. Uh, and, and that's done for obvious reasons. They're, they're worried about somebody getting in. The other thing is it's, it's highly redundant. So it, it's not the, necessarily the, the most efficient way, but it, it's, it's a time-proven way to be able to do, uh, to protect a, a, a particular piece of information or a capability that you have to have. All right, so I said I wanted to give you two different models to, to look at. And what I'd really like to do is hopefully stimulate someone to come back and say, hey, have you thought about this model and come up with, say, a third model? But this one is actually was developed by an Air Force Scientific Advisory Board study back in 2008. And their, their approach to this, if I could just take a few minutes to explain the chart, is they, 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 they took the ISO layer. So if you, if you look in the middle, you'll see the ISO layer kind of identified there, and they, but they put them together so you don't see seven. So you, they put you know, devices and linkages together, hardware and systems together. But then they added two layers to it. They put a human organization and a mission layer. So that was, they started with that foundation, and they said, so what do the attacks look like on those different layers? And so what you see on the left are the, the things that they did to try to characterize how those, those attacks would be done. And when you look there, the reason I put this attacker focus is that if you're going to try to deal with, with those different types of attack, that means you have to focus on the attacker and get the intelligence on how the attacker operates. Then the other thing they did was they said, well, what is the effect of those attacks on the users? Uh, and you see those listed on the right-hand side. So you know, at, that, at those high levels, there's disinformation, and then you, you get confusion. It disrupts our ability to do command and control. At, you know, at the, the bottom layers, you get performance loss, you, you lose your communications, completely malfunction. So the reason this, they thought this would be useful is on the right side, that's almost completely done by the operator, and they, we would refer to it as resiliency or mission assurance. So what they said was that if you're going to try to deal with this problem, you, you would need to look at this thing and break it into component parts. Now, I don't know how many in the, in the room are engineers, but that, that's how engineers think. You take a complex problem, break it into parts, 
And so they would start trying to look at this thing. So on the left side, you have this intelligence and attack response. That's tr the traditional with your network security. You have this mission assurance, which has been a traditional way that the military in particular, but, but businesses do the same thing, business resiliency. One of the things that the business community, particularly the financial community does, that we don't, for the most part, do with our networks is transaction control. So, so you, you know, there's this anonymity on the network, but if you put controls on the network, then uh, typically it's a ledger journal type approach, but it makes it more difficult uh, for something to get, to, uh, a change to be made, an alteration to be made without it being detected if you put that in place. That, that's how they, and a lot of businesses have those kinds of controls there because that's how you avoid embezzlement, by the way. But then we put this other thing in there, we said it would be a proactive defense. And what the Scientific Advisory Board said, as a matter of fact, said if you look at these, these different layers, if you think of them as, as targets, then if, if this were a military problem, you would look at those targets and say, what can I do to make it difficult for my adversary to be successful? And there's three typical things that you, that you do. You can harden it, you can maneuver it, or you can obfuscate it like stealth or you know, make it uh, camouflage so it's, so it's hard to see. So they said perhaps we should identify some of these really critical areas and, and that's how we should be looking to spend our resources. But part of the problem is that we have not had a lot of good proactive ways to deal with this develop. So, but I wanted to show you, just, you know, some of the things that have been done. So if you look from a, tr uh, a purely a ne network security standpoint, uh, and you look at this, this left-hand side there, uh, what we can do is say, well, in, in, in addition to the normal thing, they've, they've set up these uh, virtual machine sandboxes, they've done things to monitor user behavior, to look to try to detect to say that it's, you know, it's not the, the right person on there, some kind of two-factor authentication. There's been some transaction controls done primarily in the, in the business community because uh, it kind of fits for them easily. Uh, there's products out that, that will monitor your registry and, and uh, for example, in fact, in the Department of Defense now, uh, they have, it's called a host-based security system. When you first connect to a network, it actually looks to see if your registry looks the same as it did before and it, it alerts, but it doesn't do anything to fix it, but it alerts you that the registry looks different. Uh, you can do things with the hypervisor that you guys would probably know more about than I do that, that actually monitors how the operating system is behaving to see if it looks like someone tried to put something in there. And then at these lower levels, you know, they can put in resilient capabilities that if something happens, if it takes out a router or something, there's, a, there's another pathway, that type of thing. So, the, but those, these are still the fairly traditional approaches. If, if you want to try to take a look at how you would deal with these targets, uh, th these are some of the things, and a lot of them, they become more process oriented, but you'd have, you could, if you found some ways to put some technology behind it, it could be very useful. So the idea of the two-person controls, that's another new part of this thing, which is one of the ways that they make sure that some single person can't do something with a nuke is you can't do anything with, unless you have two people, and they always put the controls far enough apart that you can't possibly do both of them at the same time. If you're trying to deal with, uh, uh, with people understanding the target. So if you're, you're a good hacker and you go in and you start looking at a system and you start doing all of your reconnaissance, if that system changes, so they, they rotated the process they're using, they changed the system or the process, then you have to start over again. So that's, that's considered one of the proactive ways that you can defend. That's, that's a maneuver type or a movement thing. Uh, the session controls, they, they put a lot of, there's some different products that work with session controls now. That, that look to see if, if, a, if a session's been hijacked and, and, and they basically, they can terminate the sessions and, and minimize loss of data or damage to the system when they do that. There, there's been some uh, things done with operating system obfuscation that uh, it actually looks like it has a lot of promise. The only reason you don't see much of it being done is that uh, when, once you do that, the people administering the network have to know a lot more about the systems to be able to deal with it because it, it's going to look different to them every time. So they have to know what, what's kind of what's behind the curtain to make it work. And then at the, the bottom two you see there is uh, the banks do a lot of this, by the way, is they, they shift their hardware. So by, by rotating hardware is the same thing when you're trying to, if a, if a hacker is trying to come in, one time they go in as one piece of hardware, another time it's a different piece of hardware, it co complicates the, uh, the problem for you. And then the other thing they try to work with is, is uh, device diversity. Uh, 
That's, that's not what they do in the Department of Defense, by the way, which is a, a little bit problematic, is they, they want to make things standard, so they make, they're all the same, right? But with no diversity, if something goes wrong with one of them, then they're all going to fail. But in the business community, I think they've been a little smarter about that, so you see a lot of diversity with machines, operating systems, routers, all, all parts of the network. So that's one way to think about the, uh, the proactive defense. I, I bring this to this community to look at, if, because you might have some ideas for how technology could aid this, but when you take a look at, at how you do things from a mission assurance standpoint, it typically involves having some type of redundancy. So if, you, uh, if you're trying to, to determine if someone has, has uh, done something with your sensors, if you, if you have more than one sensor, you can compare them and at least you know that somebody's uh, done something with that. In an airplane, that's pretty typical. They have a, all of the, 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 the critical flight controls all have a backup, and one that you, you do all the time is check to make sure that they still are the same, and then if one of them is different, if they're different, then you try to figure out which one's uh, correct and which one's wrong. You assume in most military operations that you're going to lose communication, so they put in what they call lost communication processes. And so if you put those kind of things together, that's another way that you can deal particularly with some type of, uh, of an attack like that, that actually caused your comms to go out. The, uh, the redundant type apps uh, means that instead of just using one particular uh, application to do whatever your process is, you have more than one. By the way, in the Department of Defense, they're always, that, that's an anathema to them. They, they say, Shoot, we're going to standardize it and we're going to save money because we only have one. The business community says, I want to have three or four because I, if one breaks or one quits work and I want to have a backup. Uh, they, they started dealing with some of the attacks. Uh, I wanted to go to the, the talk yesterday. It was talking about some of the ways to uh, to, to uh, beat uh, some of the systems for dealing with the DDoS attacks, and I wasn't able to make it, but, uh, but th they have some things that they put in place there that, that at least would try to mitigate some of those effects. And then uh, when you get down to the hardware layer, the only way to do it is to have more than one path. And one of, the, one of the strange things about people when they talk about cloud computing and things like that, it, cloud computing is great, but if you've only got one circuit or leading to the cloud, then you only have a circuit. You, so if you don't figure out a way to leverage the cloud and you don't have multiple pathways into the, into the cloud or into that network, then you, then you have uh, a limitation. So, so that's this, this one model that uh, I guess I'm hoping that some of you would have some good ideas about how to do that better or how to, some technical ways to take advantage of that. So this next one is one that was actually put out by uh, uh, DHS and, th and their idea was uh, they were going to try to te or treat cyberspace as an ecosystem. And the, the thought there was you you're going to have a static defense, but you're also going to have this, this dynamic defense. And if you, if you look up there, the, the things that they have on there, the prevent, those are pretty typical uh, that, that you would expect. See, they, they've inserted a couple other things that, that they would like to see added, you know, like the uh, you know, the moving target idea that, that I talked about even the other one. But, but a big part of this thing is that you want to have a way to detect that something happened because for the most part, most of the, the major attacks that occur, whether it's in, in a, the commercial sector or it's uh, in government, it happens because they actually start seeing the impact. And by that, by that point, it's so far down the road that it's very difficult to contain. So trying to put processes in for detection gets to be important. That's still considered kind of the static piece of this thing. On the, the, the dynamic side, they want to have a lot of information sharing. Why? Because uh, if, if you're only looking at, at uh, small points, it, it's one thing to be able to sneak under the radar because you, you avoid crossing a level, but if you're able to bring in from multiple places and you say, hey, there, there's this kind of a odd behavior, abnormality here, and I got the same thing here and the same thing here. Now you say there's some, maybe there's something going on, and by combining the information, you can leverage that. When you see that, then they want to have processes in place to, to respond, and then as soon as they can kind of put things under control, then they want to have processes to recover. Part of this recover, by the way, and it's kind of interesting, uh, when talking to some people from 911, uh, they, they said they thought that 911 was the first cyber attack. And the reason was is that nobody could talk to anyone after it happened. It took out the, uh, no one could talk on a cell phone because everyone was trying to talk at the same time. The, uh, the actual, when the towers went down, it took out some of the, um, uh, the PBX systems. So 
So Calm virtually stopped in New York City at a time when they really needed it. And even the, the first responders were having difficulty with communications. Something similar with Katrina uh, in Louisiana, they, they actually saw where a pro there was a problem occurring with, uh, with one of the levee breaches, but they didn't have a way to communicate because they had lost, they had lost the power and, they, and, they, and once again they lost, a, they didn't realize this, when they lost their PBX system, the cell phones at that time were all tied into the PBX system. So, so once they lost that, they, they couldn't communicate, so their ability to first respond was lost. So when, when they talk about response here, a lot of this has to do with having courses of action that get you up very quickly to where you at least have a capacity to continue to do these uh, you know, public safety types of things. And, but you see at the bottom, they, they want to try to establish you know, a trusted broker, and that's what they try to do with these information sharing and analysis centers, these ISACs that, that, that they've established. So we, we did a, uh, a workshop, the, the Cyber Innovation Center for DHS, and we brought some people in from, from industry, we brought uh, people in from academia, we had people from government, and of course we had the people from DHS. And we actually tried to look at some different situations that were, uh, would be dealing with a first, of course DHS is interested in some kind of like a hurricane type thing. So we, we were dealing with a couple of different scenarios that, that, that might be a, a DHS type uh, operation where cyberspace would be affected. And we started looking to see what would be the impediments to doing this. And I got pages and pages of the things that they, they highlighted, but, but a, a few things just to highlight that I have here, and my, my goal is not to read this to you because I want to le leave you some time for questions, but the bottom line was that even when we had these experts in the room, it was very difficult to get them to think beyond the protect piece because they, we, we would tell them it, it didn't work, we've lost cyberspace, and they always wanted to go back and fight and say, no, that'll never happen. We said, no, you, it did happen, you, you have to deal with it now. And that mindset, makes it very difficult to get these other parts resourced because you know the government businesses for that matter they don't want to spend money for things that they don't think are going to happen obviously so part of the thing we've been trying to do the defcon community does a great job of this which is highlighting the fact that it's if if someone really wants to get into your network they're going to get in and we keep trying to reinforce this with people in government and in business but then to get them to actually do uh, the resources is, is really difficult. Uh, the balancing piece that you see there really has to do with the fact that they, they, they always want to put the money into the, the protection, which is good, but we've argued that if you assume that the protection is going to fail, there's some smart things that you can do to set the stage in advance so that your ability to, to basically respond minimize the impact and uh, quickly recover uh, would be helpful. We then talked about some things in, from a detection standpoint that there's a lot of noise on most of the enterprise networks, makes it difficult. Uh, a lot of the things that they have that are the automatic uh, detection mechanisms throw out so many false alarms that it's uh, very difficult to deal with. So this was actually one of the things to go back to the operator, the operational community, so the, whether it's a business or the government, the people using the system say, we really need to have you not do these things because when you do that, it, it throws so much junk on the network that we can't really tell when, when something's going wrong. Uh, there was a lot of interest in trying to set up these automatic systems to where the machines would automatically respond to deal with these things. And there's some problems with doing that, particularly with some of the, the drastic or draconian uh, response you would have. So one of the things we discussed is that you really, you, you need to have a way that you can keep a human in this decision-making loop, but be able to basically be operating a, a, a sensor response system that basically goes at the speed of, uh, of information. And, uh, and then finally, uh, I guess I actually talked about the last one there about the balancing the, the this, this, this is really for the people that, that figure out where you should spend your money. They, they need to have a process that figures out how to, how to do that. So now this is my appeal to this, uh, to this community here. When you, when you look at this, this workforce, you, you, th these are the different p elements that are involved in, in, in doing this workforce. And if I went across this room, you'd see that, that you, parts of you are involved in all these different places here. And you know we do a lot of stuff looking at, at uh, trying to eliminate the vulnerabilities and we do a lot of things where we try to go find out what the threats are. But there's some really good opportunities in, a so in the software assurance 
in the, in the parts that actually looked at the resiliency of the transaction controls and then, you know, what are the things that we can do to help make the users of the network more accountable for their actions and, and more careful about their processes. I bring this to you because I, I think this community could, could actually uh, implement this and make this work. So that's the workforce part of it. And the leader part of this is, is kind of interesting. This, this is a typical model for, for any kind of a pyramid type organization, right? But the, you have all these different functional specialties at the bottom and just like we showed on that, that little chart before, the, the communities come from many different places. We tend to get very good in those, in those individual areas. But the people at the next level, which we call the operational leaders, they're the ones that are able to integrate and pull these things together. In the cyber community, we, we haven't done a, a very good job of figuring that out. We tend to be very stovepipe. So a, a lot of the things we've been trying to do is encourage uh, people who have expertise in one part of the, of the cyberspace to, to, to cross over and do something else and learn about that other piece of it so that they can help later with this integration. At the, the strategic level, that's where you're actually trying to tie the thing back in and you're trying to, to make it useful. And the other part that we're trying to do is we have a lot of strategic leaders today that, that know virtually nothing about cyberspace. They, they, they don't want to know in some cases, uh, but it's, it's incumbent on us to try to get them to understand the things that you know about cyberspace so that they can be better strategic leaders and they can better leverage cyberspace. So. That's what I hope that I was able to talk to you about today. I, I think I left us with a few minutes for, for question. I'm happy to take questions. I'm also, I brought my pen with me because I'm also happy to take ideas. But thanks so much for spending time with me and uh, I hope that you have a great DEF CON. Where you going? You don't have any questions? You with the long hair, come back here. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Come on. <laughs> yeah, they, needless to say, they don't give us wireless mics here. <laughs> <laughs> you, you really tantalized us with a conversation about nuclear weapons and that they're not connected to the internet but connected via circuits. Um, I know you probably can't give us details, but at least tell us you've got the best people on this. And it's all two-man control too. So, yeah, it, no, they're they, they 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 the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy uh, both put their best people on. It's kind of interesting. You know, we talk about this two-person thing. By the way, it, it even goes to the, you know the Department of Defense does not own the weapons. The Department of Energy it, and it's done that way. They they everything's split right down to the, to the weapons itself. So the Department of Energy owns the weapons, not the Department of Defense. So it's that kind of approach that. Uh, uh, they, they really try to lock themselves into. I, I, I tell you though, it's kind of interesting. If you think about administrators on, on systems, and see the banks do this by the way, they, they set up their, their super administrator accounts and it takes two people to, to be able to get into the log or, or do anything to affect it because they don't want anybody tampering with the logs. It's, once again, it's a two person approach to things. There's, the, the point is there's a lot of things that we can do that w wouldn't necessarily cost a lot of money but we just, haven't had the people think it through enough to, to figure out how to do it, and we don't have the people with the expertise. So, um, earlier you draw the comparison between um, like uh, TSA and oh. cybersecurity. I was wondering. So we know if we don't have a TSA, we know the kinds of things that can happen. You know, people put bombs on planes, people turn planes into bombs. Could you imagine a, a uh, cyber world without a dedicated cybersecurity force um, and what that would look like? Why, why, do we, why do we need that in a way that we need the TSA to protect lives? Well, when, when, when the internet was established, and, what, and what's funny about the internet, it, it, it was it, when you go back to the initial ARPANET, in fact, I, I'll give away some of my age. I mean, I, I got to use one of the initial ARPANET terminals. And uh, it was, it was a, just a research thing and it was just uh, trusted people that were working together just like uh, you, would, uh, you would go to a bar and you'd, you'd tell your buddies uh, a story about something going on in your life and, and you trusted them and that, that's the whole uh, origin of this thing. So now what's happened is after the fact, we're having to figure out a way uh, to make sure that people don't use it against you, if you will. And so, so the cybersecurity 
is, is basically how people could still use cyberspace but, but have a way to feel like they're still protected. Uh, but, the, but the reality is I think you need to have a dedicated cybersecurity force, but I also think that one of the mistakes that we make is we, we let our users off the hook, particularly on these enterprise systems, and we don't hold them accountable for their actions because the, the, the best defense at the point of the spear is for that, that person, that operator that's on the system to say, you know, that doesn't look right and then do something about it rather than wait until it gets to be so big that you do have to have the, the cybersecurity professional come in and deal with it. But no, you, th there's no way we can ever go back. This, the, the cybersecurity field is going to continue to grow. M my argument here is it, there's some other ways it should grow beyond a, just a purely a security standpoint and expand into this defense, you know, more proactive defense and possibly even this mission assurance uh, type of an approach. So I'm sure everyone is happy to hear that Elvis Presley is in the house and has a question about cyber. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> I'm Elvis. You may have heard of me. I'm kind of a big deal in the city. So, um, so one thing that, that has happened in history is um, like for Pearl Harbor, you know, Pearl Harbor came out of nowhere and brought us in, um, even 9-11. <clears throat> Before 9-11, there were people already saying the things that needed to happen, and no one wants to spend money until after the crisis. Uh, we even saw it for Y2K, and you know, you, you were probably like 50 then. So, um, <clears throat> so even for Y2K, <laughs> even for Y2K though, there were people saying, you know, there's problems in code, and when it rolls over, there could be a problem. There were people that told Congress this, and we always waited to the last minute. Um, our, for cyber, we're doing the same thing. We're saying the same stuff, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you're here, and you're giving a lot of good information, and you're soliciting information. That's, I think that's great to partner like that. But what's being done to actually get the wheels to actually turn? Are we going to have to have like a cyber Pearl Harbor before anybody really wants to put money into this? Because everything's going to cost money, no matter how smart we are. So it, that, that's a great question. So. So first, Elvis, the, ba the bad news is that history has a tendency to repeat itself. So before we really see them putting the money into this that they need to, there, there probably will end up having to be a cyber Pearl Harbor. That's the bad news. The good news is that in, in a lot of the sectors, uh, business people like to make money, and, but they're also risk adverse. So they've, uh, they actually bring in risk management principles into, into the way that they do these things. So uh, a, a lot of these companies are now starting to invest the money that they need to, particularly the larger companies. Uh, I'll tell you, the, the defense contractors, they, they, they now, with what they now know about what the threats are, they're definitely putting money into these types of things because they're, they're fully aware. The banks understand it. Some, some of the other communities have done that. So the, com the communities that recognize that their ability to continue to operate the way that, that allows them to make money or to do with their business, they are now starting to, to uh, put money in, the, in those kinds of places. But we're, we're still like maybe 10% of, of all the sectors in the United States, and everybody else just assumes that the government's going to protect them from this, and this is not something, I mean, Cybercom is not gonna protect uh, the, uh, the small business owner from a cyber attack. So. And it, once, once they figure that out, that, that's the first thing. It's like, I tell people it's like the 12 steps you know, for an alcoholic. The first thing you gotta admit you have a problem. Most people, and I said the, the thing that scared me when we did this one workshop, I had these experts in there, and even with those experts, they kept trying to go back and say, well, clearly we'll figure out a way to keep this from happening. And it's, it's very difficult to get people into that mindset. It's, it's one of the things that you guys, in, through these conferences, do is you, you, you highlight to people that there are these vulnerabilities and, and hopefully, you know, repetition, they'll hear it. And so I applaud you for doing that and I encourage you to keep doing that because it's the only way we're gonna get the message across. Three questions. Um, uh, one question, there's two other people waiting, we gotta get out of here. Okay, I'll say all three at once and you get to answer all of them at once, I like it. Okay. That is just, um, uh, you're manipulating the system, that is inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that we've seen DARPA do 
is that they've engaged the community through the Cyber Fast Track. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, Cyber Fast Track has now been turned off. It, will DHS or anybody else pick up this, or will all the money go to the big contractors and slow innovation, or will we see the same kind of initiative engage this community to develop those unique ideas, those u unique defenses? Yeah, so uh, I didn't realize, I thought this, DARPA still had money in the cyber fast track, but. Defunded. But that is somewhat typical for DARPA. DARPA's thing is supposed to be able to get something started and then, and then have others try to pick it up. So what I can tell you is uh, D DH DHS does have some programs. Uh, in fact, the stuff that, that I do at the Cyber Innovation Center, which is pro bono work for me, uh, is, is work that's actually funded by the National Science Foundation and by DHS. But if you go, if you go around the country, there there are a number of, and they, they tend to be nonprofits that have stood up all around the country that are that are starting to take this thing on. So it's it's, it's becoming somewhat of a grassroots effort, and I'm actually encouraged by that. There there is a lot of interest to do that. So. Uh, the other, but it, it's not going to have the kind of funding that the DARPA was able to put into, though. That's the challenge. Yeah, the other thing that's being defunded is the DIB. You've mentioned the DIB during yeah. this whole process. Um, who's going to take that uh, initiative? Well, so the, the, the DIB pilot went out, but the, but, but the, the information sharing continues. So, so it's, it's all important. But they, they do still have the information sharing piece, but they're using the ISAC to do it now. Yes, sir. Uh, to what degree do you think, uh, uh, from a uh, I uh, information assurance uh, standpoint, we can start uh, selecting for what uh, Nassim Talib, uh, the guy who wrote Black Swan, would call anti-fragility? Uh, the sense that right now we're in an environment of of lar small, uh, of few large targets, large fragile targets, mm -hmm. crack once, exploit everywhere. Uh, where what we need to do is start going towards a diversity of smaller, more uh, robust targets. Uh, how are we going to get that changed around since the business imperative seems to be towards uh, consolidation, conglomeration, and, uh, single su and, and, and single source support, uh, much the way, uh, standardization, much the way that DOD does? You're exactly right. It's a, it's a, it's a huge problem because uh, particularly in the business community, they're looking for efficiencies. I'm, uh, at, with sequestration in particular, everybody's looking for efficiencies in government as well. Where, where I see some encouragement, by the way, for your, for your question is, is actually in the business community and the process that they're using is called a, is a risk management process. They, they apply it across their business. They're now starting to apply it to their cyber systems. What, what I'm worried about is that they're, they're now starting to do some things like in the industrial sectors with the industrial controls or things like energy, uh, transportation, uh, they're, they're now starting to look at this, but it turns out they're looking at it and they say, you know, we designed it to be this very efficient system. It's difficult to go back in and re-engineer it to be the other way, but they are starting to do it now. The only way to keep this thing going is we, we have to keep, you know, we have to keep telling the business owners, we have to keep telling the Congress uh, that it's important to not put all your eggs in one basket be, and, and demonstrate to them what, what could happen. Sir, you did a lot of talking about the processes and the high-level strategies. One of the things I've seen over and over again in government organizations that I've worked with is that this is about the people. The government has gone to a point where it's about the certifications you have, you know, DOD 8570 and, and so forth, mm -hmm. to where we've lined a lot of pockets of certification companies in or, an effort to prove that people know these skills. But on the outside, in the commercial sector, that doesn't seem to be the case. They don't have th as much desire to have people with certifications as to be able to prove that they can do the job. And if they can't do the job, they move on. And they have a hierarchy set up to allow people to grow within their organization in most government contracting <coughs> companies that I've seen. And in the, organ in the government, military, and civilian markets as well, they, average they want people to get a large breadth of knowledge. Is there any thought about maybe changing that paradigm to where we get specialists, where we let people focus in on the technical aspects, on the things they like to do that they're good at, and let them stay there without penalizing them within the system, and maybe getting away from 
making it so hard to get rid of people and encouraging growth from within. Yeah, so to be perfectly honest, I, I still have friends in government that, that, that work on the personnel sides of things, and, and they actually are looking at the exact type of thing you're, you're talking about. Uh, a lot of the standardization piece was kind of funny. They actually were trying to mimic what they saw on the outside, and, and they said, we, we should try to do something like that. But, of course, whenever the government does something, it gets, you know, turns into it, it's very bureaucratic, uh, and you kind of lose sight of the actual objective, and, and you get locked into all the, all the processes, the bureaucratic processes. But uh, there's a huge effort, number one, to try to grow a, a cyber workforce, particularly in the Department of Defense, but in, in the other government agencies. And they're looking to find ways to make it attractive, quite frankly, for people to do that. So the types of things you're talking about are all being considered. And so, so one of the things, by the way, I'm, I'm not in that business myself, but I, but I you know, have a lot of friends that, that still work with that. And so I'll give you my card because I'm, I'm looking to get those ideas and, uh, and I'll pass it to them. So let, let me make sure I give you a card before you run out of here. Thank you very much. Do, do, do you have yeah. Okay. All right. So um, we, we need to clear the stage for the next speakers, but we're going to take the general over to um, the, the, the chill out cafe. So he'll do some Q&A there before he heads out to the airport. All right. Thank you very much.